me start by giving a brief background of Tata Biocenter. We've been working in the PCR field since 1991. In the early days, we developed dyes and probes that became force in the combining DNA. At that time, we do, did not know how to use them, but that became obvious when Rasiguchi invented PCR or qPCR in 1993. Since then, we have established collaborations with all leading qPCR instrument and solution providers, running today the best equipped laboratories for qPCR work in Europe. We offer hands-on training in qPCR. Every month, Tata organizes two to three courses somewhere around the world, training annually more than 700 researchers. We are Europe's leading provider of qPCR services, offering routine analysis as well as latest technologies, such as the RNSH dependent PCR for rare mutation analysis recently developed by IDT. We develop products for qPCR focusing on experimental design optimization and quality control. And researchers and students are welcome to Tata, bringing their samples and performing experiments under our guidance using latest and most advanced qPCR tools and technologies. Tata is a member of the European Spedia Consortium that aims at standardizing the pre-analytical process of molecular diagnostics. Among our activities, we organize proficiency ring trials. Any European laboratory is welcome to join, free of charge. They receive samples from us with instructions. Last ring trial, we distributed blood samples and asked participating laboratories to extract RNA and return it to us for quality assessment. We tested several quality parameters and found that 33% of the participating laboratories had at least two quality parameters out of control. Tata contributed to the writing of the MyKey guidelines, advising qPCR workers how to perform and report qPCR results, such that quality can be assessed by independent researchers and results reproduced. The MyKey guidelines are receiving great attention among qPCR users as well as journals. Tata was also the first laboratory in Europe to obtain flexible ISO 17025 certification for nucleic acid analysis with qPCR. But let's talk about science. This is an island of Langehans stained for alpha cells. Now the islet is stained also for alpha cells. And here it is stained also for beta cells. As seen, the islet is a mosaic of the three cell types. The three cell types are very different, being involved in diverse functions and responding to different stimuli. If we analyze the entire islet or any part of it, we will measure the collective response of all the cells present, rather than the response of any particular cell type. As a consequence, the response of the interesting cell type may be swamped or blurred by the responses of the other non-relevant cells. To approach the complexity often encountered when studying biological samples, we developed single cell qPCR expression profiling. This slide shows qPCR response curves of insulin 1 in individual beta cells collected from a cell line. The good news are the data are of excellent quality. Indeed, the quality of single cell expression data is typically superior to the quality of conventional samples composed of many cells. This may surprise. Reason is, the technical issues of qPCR, typically inhibition and RNA degradation, are caused by extracellular factors. Analyzing carefully washed single cells, we rarely experience RNA degradation or PCR inhibition. However, there is substantial cell-to-cell -cell variability, even between seemingly like cells, such as these collected from culture, we find large spread of qPCR response curves. 
summarizing the data in a histogram showing the frequency of cells containing number of transcripts in certain ranges, we find highly skewed distribution. These data show expression of beta actin. Some 40 cells have between 0 and 100 transcripts. 25 cells had between 100 and 200 transcripts, and 15 cells had between 200 and 300 transcripts, and so forth. Most cells harbor very few transcripts. Only very, very few cells are rich in transcripts. These are the same data presented with logarithmic scale for the x-axis indicating the number of transcripts. We see the spread can now be modeled with a normal distribution, evidencing the distribution of beta actin transcripts among beta cells in culture is consistent with a log normal distribution. Today we know log normal distributions of transcripts among like cells is the norm, being observed for most cell types as well as genes. The log normal distribution has interesting consequences. When we study classical samples based on thousands of cells, we can measure total expression and divide with a number of cells to obtain an average. This average, known as the arithmetic average, will not give the count of transcripts in the typical cell. The typical cell is considered to be the cell in the middle. If we take all the cells in the population and sort them, based on the numbers of a particular transcript they contain. Because of the underlying log normal distribution, the number of transcripts in the typical cell is given by the geometric average rather than the arithmetic average. The geometric average of transcripts per cell cannot be determined in the classical experiment. It can only be calculated from single cell measurement. Did you find that confusing? Well, you are not alone. This is a summary of our paper in Nature Genetics. So what is the origin of the log normal distribution? This has been shown in beautiful work by Jonathan Chubb and others. Using fluorescence in situ hybridization, they measured expression in live single cells over time. Let me show a movie. The bright spot that appears, disappears, and reappears again are transcripts. Clearly, the number of transcripts in the cell vary over time. This is known as transcriptional bursting. Transcripts of a gene are produced on mass in bursts, followed by a slow decay. Then there is a new burst and a decay. Integrating over time, we obtain a gamma distribution that is similar in shape to the log normal distribution we find for the distribution of transcripts among individual cells. The pulse interval and pulse duration depends on gene activity and locus, but are typically of the order of minutes to hours. In our first study, we measured expression of five genes per cell. That was neat but not good enough. We wanted to measure more genes and develop a highly optimized workflow for high throughput single cell profiling. This included fluorescence activated cell sorting of single cells, direct lysis using a reagent compatible with downstream RTQ-PCR to eliminate losses due to washing, highly optimized reverse transcription and preamplification. Preamplification is a highly multiplexed PCR performed a limited number of cycles. The purpose is to increase the concentration and number of target copies for downstream single sec singleplex qPCR. Each singleplex qPCR 
should start with at least some 25 target copies to avoid sampling ambiguity. A limited number of amplicons is performed to avoid competition between the reactions. QPCR assays for preamp are carefully optimized and validated by comparing analysis via preamp and direct amplification using a standard sample. Deviations from expected delta CQ with and without preamplification reflect bias and standard deviations of replicates reflect reproducibilities. In this particular case, only one assay show poor reproducibility. Few assay, assays exhibit bias, but that can be handled. Remaining assays perform very well. The very large number of singleplex qPCRs required is performed in nanoliter volumes using one of the two high throughput platforms available to us. The Quant Studio from LifeTech, which is good for 3072 independent qPCR reactions, or the Biomark from Fluidine, where 96 samples are profiled for 96 markers in a single run. To handle and mine the large amounts of qPCR data generated, we use the GenX software. And to correlate the results to biological functions, we do pathway analysis using the iReport. So let's see how this works in practice. We were interested to study the response of astrocytes to brain trauma. Using a mouse model that expresses green fluorescein protein under the control of the astrocyte marker GFAP, we could sacrifice mice at different time points after trauma and collect single astrocytes using FAGs. Inspecting the measured expression profiles, we recognize the log normal distributions. But wait a minute. This is not a normal distribution. This gene, which is Vimenton, shows two distinct peaks evidencing heterogeneity, most likely due to the presence of two subpopulations of astrocytes. The measured data can be analyzed by traditional means, comparing expression of genes one at a time before and after trauma using, for example, t-test, calculating differential expression, and collecting the information in Volcano plot. However, this is not particularly powerful approach. It suffers from multiple testing ambiguity, with many of the apparently differentially expressed genes being false positives. And it does not take advantage of genes correlated expressions. Genes are not expressed independently of each other, rather groups of genes involved in the same expression pathway or part of the same network are expressed in concert. This can be exploited using multivariate methods. Multivariate methods classify samples based on genes correlated expressions. Most powerful is principal component analysis PCA. The cells are shown in a scatter plot with the axis PC1 and PC2, that's the principal components. They are linear combinations of the genes and can be thought of being supermarkers, virtual genes that have the combined properties of the real genes such that they best separate different types of astrocytes based on their expression patterns. Astrocytes from healthy brains are shown in blue. Astrocytes collected three days after trauma are shown in yellow. Astrocytes collected seven days after trauma are shown in green. And astrocytes collected 14 days after trauma are shown in red. In the graph, it is seen that cells gradually move 
from top left corner through the center towards the right side, evidencing changes in expression in response to the trauma. The astrocytes are becoming reactive. Even better separation is obtained in a three-dimensional plot, which accounts for even more of the variation. This is evident when viewing the 3D data using an interactive tool such as GenX. I'm now starting something known as a dynamic PCA in GenX, showing you the same data as in my slide. The advantage is that here I can rotate and view the data from different angles to better see the separation. Then, uh, many of the genes that we have studied or included in our profiling experiment will not be sensitive to the conditions that we study. These genes will not contribute to separation, rather they will contribute noise. By removing the non-responsive genes from the analysis, we shall improve the separation. This can be done using a filter that removes genes with least variation across samples. The filter is applied using the slider here. So now I'm sequentially removing genes from the analysis and doing that I actually obtain a better separation. Having done that before I know I will get a pretty nice results with about 18 genes remaining. Uh, you can see now that there is a very very clear separation between the reactive astrocytes at 14 days after trauma shown in red and those collected in the beginning. You can also see that even uh, here you can separate the yellow, green and blue. But furthermore, that becomes even clearer when I connect myeline astrocytes. The ac reactive astrocytes are not a homogeneous population, but rather there are two subclusters here evidencing that there are two groups of reactive astrocytes. Returning to the original two-dimensional PCA graph, we can ind indicate the genes that are activated or suppressed as function of time after trauma as the astrocytes are activated. We can also calculate the correlation between the different genes expressions among the individual cells. The correlation coefficient is a number between minus 1 and 1 and is calculated for each pair of genes. Numbers close to 1 indicated in green color are gene pairs expressed at the same time in the same cell. Numbers around 0 indicate genes that are expressed independently of each other and negative correlation which is not observed here would indicate genes with opposite regulation. When one gene is upregulated, the other is downregulated. Correlation may be direct or indirect. Consider three genes. There may be a master gene that induces the other two. The dependence may be sequential, or all three genes may be directly dependent on each other. The difference between direct and indirect dependences can be illustrated with a more tangible example. A few years ago, a Swedish newspaper studied the consequences of hot, hot summer weather. They found when the temperature was high, Swedes were eating more ice cream. They also found when the weather was hot, drowning accidents were more frequent. So they concluded consuming ice cream increases the risk of drowning. Sure, they observed significant correlation 
between eating ice cream and drowning accidents, but failed to realize the phenomena had a common trigger that induces indirect or accidental correlation. We can distinguish direct and indirect correlations by evaluating partial correlations. Using this strategy, we can calculate expression networks, indicating genes expected to be dependent of each other. Network analysis is a rapidly growing field offering important insight into biological functions. Classical network analysis is based on correlated expression of genes in bulk that respond to common stimuli. Here, we base the networks on genes expressed at the same time but also in the same cell. Typically, our networks are more distinct because of the much lower complexity of the responses of individual cells. The genes we identify as being differentially expressed and relevant for the phenomenon studied can from GenX be launched via the internet for cloud-based pathway analysis using the Ingenuity I report. So now I'm on the internet uh, you, and have logged into the Ingenuity I report. So here are my differentially expressed genes. Uh, the sizes indicate fold change between reactive and uh, normal astrocytes. And here, for example, I can identify the pathways the genes are involved in. 10 of the genes are involved in the glutamate receptor signaling, which will soon be shown to me, hopefully. And this uh, shows also other genes involved in the same pathway that I can now include in further studies of expression profiling of my cells. Can we go beyond the single cell? Indeed we can. This is a single cell, albeit a very large single cell. It is an oocyte from the frog Xenopus levis. It's not only large, its two hemispheres have different shading. This makes it easy to embed, orient, and mount the oocyte in a cryostat and slice it. We can then measure the transcripts in the slices, which will reflect any intracellular gradients. This graph shows intracellular gradients of transcripts from the animal pole at the left to the vegetal pole at the right. We find these transcripts are off from the center, being closer to the animal pole. We find, however, other transcripts that are most abundant in slices closer to the vegetal pole. And most interestingly, we find a third group of transcripts exclusively in the extreme slices at the vegetal pole. These transcripts should be associated with a cell wall. We validated these results using the independent technique of digital PCR. In digital PCR, a single sample is analyzed using a platform having a very large number of reaction containers. The number of containers should be of the same order as the number of target molecules in the sample. When the sample is distributed into the platform, most reaction containers remain empty while some contain a single molecule. PCR amplification produces products only in those containers that initially contained target molecules. Counting the number of positive PCRs, we know the initial number of target molecules that were present in the sample. These are digital PCR data on the off the side. Distribution of the two 
transcripts are shown. However, now the oil site is only divided into five segments. As you can see, most of the OCT-60 transcripts are found in the second and third segment of the oil site, red color indicating positive PCRs, while almost all WINT-11 transcripts are in the segment closest to the vegetal pole. Clearly, the digital PCR and qPCR data are consistent. The intracellular gradients of transcripts have consequences on the symmetry of cell division. The first cell division of the oocyte is along the animal vegetal axis and is not affected by the gradients we observe. Second cell division is also along the animal vegetal axis and is not affected by the gradients. However, the third cell division intersects the animal vegetal gradients, introducing a symmetry among the eight blastomers formed. Notably, however, although the asymmetry is not manifested on the blastomer level until the eight cell stage, it was present already in the beginning in the oocyte. These are some beautiful data collected on the Biomark using the 96 by 96 chip. It's a total of 9,216 parallel reactions. Nice, but so what? We have seen many similar data before. Well, you see these data reflect protein levels. Using the proximity extension assays, developed at Oling Biosciences, we measure proteins. The assay is based on pair of antibodies targeting the same protein. The antibodies are tagged with oligonucleotides that are complementary in the three prime ends. When and only when they are brought into proximity by the binding to the protein, <coughs> The three prime ends hybridize and in the presence of a polymerase and primers, they initiate PCR. The amount of PCR product formed is proportional to the initial amount of target protein that was present. Only one microliter of crude sample is sufficient for analysis. The workflow is based on pre-amplification followed by high throughput qPCR. And as before, the data are analyzed using multivariate methods using GenX. This spring, an oncology panel was launched, which in summer will be followed by a cardiovascular panel, and later in autumn, there will be an inflammation panel. A related technology, proximity ligation assays, is available from Life Technologies. Here, the oligonucleotide tethers have opposite polarity. They are sealed by a complementary oligonucleotide and ligated by polymerase. The ligated strand then serves as template for PCR. Also, this reaction requires proximity and the amount of PCR product reflects the amount of protein target that was present. We have developed protocol to lyse a single cell, split the volume into three aliquots that are assayed for the presence of DNA, RNA and proteins respectively. Cells from a sarcoma cell line were transfected with a vector expressing the FUS oncogene tagged with green fluorescent protein. With qPCR, the amount of plasmid was measured. With RT-qPCR, we measured FUS GFP mRNA, but also related microRNA and long known coding RNA. And with PLA-PCR, we measured FUS GFP protein. 
we see positive correlation between DNA, mRNA, and protein levels of FUS at the single cell level, consistent with the central dogma of Jim Watson and Francis Crick. We also found positive correlation between MERS-31, cyclin D1, and small nucleolar RNA CD box 48. And negative correlation between the levels of ectopic FUS GFP DNA and cyclin D1. This is the first time we observe negative correlation on the single cell level. Finally, let me just show some of the products we have developed at Tata for single cell profiling. We have the cellulizer reagent that I mentioned for single cell lysis, which is compatible with downstream RT-PCR. We have highly optimized reagents for reverse transcription, preamplification, and PCR. We have reagents for quality control, the valid prime to measure genomic DNA background and compensate for it, exogenous controls, DNA and RNA spikes to estimate yields and test for inhibition. We have even used them to micro-inject them into cells and validating the entire protocol. And interplate calibrators to remove variation between qPCR runs. Uh, for analysis, we use GenX to mine qPCR data and the iReport for pathway analysis. The services we offer to our clients are in collaboration with leading companies such as Roche, Fluidime, Life for mRNA expression, Exicon and Tere for microRNA, Olink for protein, LifeTech for digital PCR, Thermo Fisher, Kaj and Meshery Nagel for sample extraction. So thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take your questions. Okay, uh, Professor Kubista, thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, at this time, if you haven't already done so, um, feel free to enter your questions into the questions box. And that's located at the right-hand side of your screen in the GoToWebinar software. And yep, you can click on the plus sign or the little out arrow in, on the Mac and just pop that window out and type into it. Um, I'm going to briefly, while people take an opportunity to do that, I'm going to just show you guys a couple of the things that IDT has to offer. So with that said, um, for qPCR, IDT offers our primetime qPCR probes and assays. And I just, I'm just putting this up here with some of the key features. We have validated qPCR assays for human, mouse, and rat sequences. And uh, there's, there's easy selection tools for finding your gene and for locating where it recognizes and such. Um, you can get five prime nuclease based probe assays, or you can get intercalating dye based assays that are primer only. And then also, since we're talking about small volume PCRs and uh, things like digital PCR, I just wanted to mention that we have a really great product called the uh, Zen Double Quenched Probe. And that's, uh, it's got two quenchers on the molecule and you get really low background, you get really great signal to the background. So um, these are very important things when you're working with these small volumes. Uh, we also provide a ton of free um, information as far as uh, qPCR assay design. We have our Sci Tools design tools, which from our homepage, you can see we have the Sci Tools drop down menu. And you can find a list of all the things here. And there's various calculators in there. So we have our um, Primetime qPCR assay selection can be done from the Sci tools, as well as you can do completely custom designs for PCR or qPCR. We have our oligo analyzer that will do sequence analysis for um, DNA oligos, and it'll give your TMs and whatnot based on your reaction conditions. So there's all kinds of free calculators, uh, the dilution and resuspension calculators for, for whatever application. And then we have a great deal of educational material. We have a IDT decoded newsletter. Uh, we write articles that are um, basically we offer core concepts and tips on 
various scientific techniques, including qPCR and synthetic biology, next generation sequencing, RNAi, um, a, a whole variety of applications. And we do interviews with prominent researchers and talk about what they're what they're currently working on and what they've recently published. So it's just a really fun thing that we produce. It's a great read. It's free. And that's at www.idtdna.com forward slash decoded. And then I also wanted to just bring up the uh, bring up the qPCR application guide. This is a free application guide that we have. We talk about everything from basic qPCR types, um, technologies, instruments, reaction setup, troubleshooting. There's all kinds of great stuff in here. You can get that free, again, from that www.idtdna.com and forward slash prime time. So if you go on our prime time product page, you can find the link for the free application guide. And if you want any help finding answers to a specific question, you can in, uh, email our customer care at custcare at idtdna.com. So having spent enough time on that, I'm now going to move back to uh, Professor Kavista and we will answer some of your questions. So let me hand control back to him. Okay, so we do have a few questions that are waiting for us, Professor Kapista. I think I have, let's see here. Sorry, I had you muted there. Okay, so the first question that we have um, is regarding microRNA, is it... Is it possible to do the single cell profiling in for microRNA? And is there anything special as far as the preamplification step? I don't think uh, in small scale. Yes, I mean we did measure microRNAs in single cells, but uh, we have we are not preamplifying them because we don't really feel comfortable about that yet. However, uh, there are papers published on uh, high throughput microRNA profiling uh, that, it, that uses preamplification. However, in our hands, not yet. Okay. Um, here's another question. This is, uh, you're referring to, I think, uh, beta cells. And this person wants to know if when you're counting the transcripts per cell, how do you ensure that what you've analyzed is a single cell and not a, a doublet or a cluster of cells. Mm. Uh, that that's that that's a good that's a good question, and it, it can be tricky. Uh, in fact, uh, we very much rely on 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 the fact sorting, and uh, initially it it took quite some time to uh, get a, a high uh, success rate on sorting single cells. It is possible to test that you get single cells because one can do, a, 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 for example, a DNA analysis. And uh, you do also get a feeling uh, of, of the total expression from the genes that you measure. But, but that's, that's essentially how you do it. Of course, if you pick individual cells uh, using a pipette, then you have everything under control, which actually some of the beta cell work was, was not done by fax, but was actually done uh, using pipettes to pick individual or micro aspiration of individual cells. Okay. Um, that kind of leads to this next question. This actually came up earlier too, is how can you normalize your expression for single cell experiments and do you use any reference genes? It's a very common question. That's why we had it earlier also. Uh, it's very important. You can't normalize single cell expression with reference genes because of the underlying burst kinetics, because uh, different, different genes are expressed at different time points in different cells. However, that's not a problem because uh, the, the most intuitive normalization is per cell. So that's what everybody's using in the field. You, you just express the number of transcripts per cell. Okay. Um, all right, here's an interesting question. So does, does what you're saying about single cell analysis, does that also apply if you have 
a cloned expanded cell population. Do you still get that uh, variability? You mean, yeah, whether you get a variability. In our experience is that any cells that have active uh, transcription shows this kind of variability because it's a property of the mechanism of how genes are being expressed in cells. So if there's dynamics, we do see the variability. In fact, the only exception that I am aware of, that's actually oocytes before they act initiate transcriptional activity. So in the silent oocyte, you don't have any variation, then it's actually perfectly uh, the, the perfect agreement between different oil signs. Ah, yeah, very interesting. Um, this is a question that did not come up. Uh, so, can this technology be applied to plants? Uh, well, I, I I believe so, but uh, it will be tough to lyse uh, the 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 cells. You want to have to have tools to lyse cells, and and lysing plant cells is 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 much more trickier. However, uh, probably one will have to uh, do more, do uh, or introduce washing steps, so there may be some losses, but I certainly believe it, it can be standardized so the protocol can be uh, reasonably reproducible. Uh, be aware that the differences between individual cells that we see are actually very, very large, which means that we can actually live with some confounding variation. Sure. Um, and as long as we're on that track, I'll ask this question too. So how about fixed cells? Well, they mentioned uh, laser usually, capture. Oh yeah. Uh, laser capture cells from laser capture uh, can be analyzed. Uh, fixed cells, usually the quality is really, really poor and typically people are not analyzing fixed cells. So, uh, uh, a lot of uh, cells that are fixed are, are for, for example, using fact sorting, and usually people do not try to analyze uh, expression profile in those cells because the results are poor. So recommendation is avoid fixation of cells. Okay. So given what we've talked about about reference genes, what would you recommend for determining absolute transcript number for single cells and comparing the relative expression levels of your target genes? Well, determining absolute values is, uh, is well, tricky, or rather it does take some effort, because uh, one, one really then has to calibrate for uh, the reverse transcription reaction, which, actually, which we have done in a few cases, and we have published some numbers on that. Typically, the reverse transcription yield is between 0.5 and 80%, so there's a huge variation between transcripts. Uh, if uh, if uh, the protocol includes a pre-amplification step, that also has to be calibrated for. And uh, uh, then uh, it's also a matter of how to get uh, the calibrator into the cell. Uh, I mean, we have done microinjection with uh, our uh, RNA spikes into the cells. But for most uh, analysis that is relevant in, in biology, you don't really need absolute numbers. Uh, because uh, uh, typically you characterize the cells based on their profiles, there's the relative expression of the different genes, and that does not require absolute numbers. Okay. Um, I think that this might be a bit of a, a general qPCR question. So they're asking, is it sufficient to amplify approximately 100 base pairs of a gene motif for generalization of the regulation of that gene's expression pattern? And what they're saying, then they said, in other words, even if the PCR technology worked perfectly well, couldn't certain motifs be unpredictably masked? And then impair. Whoa. I'm going to send this question to you really quick. Let you read it. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I'm not sure if I understand everything that they're getting at in that question. It's also possible to just send this person an email afterwards to clarify, or if they can. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think there is more behind that question. I mean, uh, there are there are certainly there are certainly some sequences that are very very hard to amplify. Uh, actually, some already some 15 years ago, we we showed that some uh, sequences could not be amplified in the presence of PCR buffers that contain potassium, and then we actually also found the reason, and the reason was that certain sequences formed intramolecular uh, guanine quadruplex structures and they can't be melted and in fact uh, because of those uh, reports from us uh, many of the vendors removed potassium in the PCO buffers so that's certainly one example and uh, there may be others okay all right um, this next question yeah, this is a good one. So regarding a single cell transcriptomic anal amplification and profiling, do you have any experience looking at like single cell transcriptome and is there a method that you would prefer for that as far as quantitative analysis? Well, if, if, if we are talking about amplifying the transcriptome, uh, that is uh, amplifying the RNAs rather than doing the reverse transcription first. Uh, we did look into that some seven years ago was the method that were uh, available in, in, in those days and they were not sufficient enough for single cell profiling in our hands. Uh, these methods may have improved since then and because but we have not come got back to that. Today we use the uh, uh, preamp PCR protocol. Okay, sure. Um, so this next question comes back to the um, basic, basic qPCR preparation again. Um, do you perform an RNA quality check on your single cell samples? Uh, usually not because it would be uh, too expensive. Because, uh, in every sample we have to analyze some 100 cells, but we have done it. Uh, however, be aware, uh, the amount of RNA is, is very low, which means that one cannot run a classical uh, capillary electrophoresis. Uh, so, uh, however, what one can do is to uh, um, uh, do a differential analysis such that a gene is analyzed using uh, PCR reactions that amplify two uh, fragments of different length of the same transcript. And essentially, by comparing the yields of these two amplicons, uh, we have an idea about the uh, integrity of the RNA. And in fact, this works so well, so we are, we'll be launching that as a product this autumn. Uh, it's uh, turned out to be even more sensitive than capillary electrophoresis, and it is applicable to single cells. But on a routine basis, we don't do that. It would be too expensive. Okay. This person's asking if accurate cell counts are hard to come by with facts. Um, for example, um, many events are acellular. You get, you know, some material that's just not in a cell. Is it good enough to normalize the input RNA amount going into the R RT reaction? Well. Uh... That it's 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 a it's it's a tricky question uh, because there are other aspects here. Uh, it's really not a good it's it's really not a particularly good idea to to uh, uh, compare the expression in in single cells with two cells with three cells and so forth. So the reason is that when the number of cells increases, we are averaging out uh, the dynamics of the burst kinetics, which means that we can get we, we may see differences that are like of, of a different origin, so to speak. But but uh, uh, I'm not. But the, the, I think there are other problems. I'm not really sure how you would even measure the total amount of RNA in a single cell. It's just so little of it. So it's 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 not as smooth method either. I think that if there are issues in faxing the cells consider other methods to pick the cells. Uh, laser microdissection can be used. We have some experience of that. And uh, uh, we, one can also use microaspiration to collect the cells into to, to capillaries. 
And we have even used uh, modified patch pipettes to actually open a cell and suck out the cytoplasm. That can be done even in tissues. Okay. A little bit of a follow-up on that. So when you're doing, when you're trying to like decide if your result is uh, what you kind of expect for that cell, do you usually look at multiple genes in each cell sample? So you can like look and see all of my, all the stuff I analyze for the cell is, you know, twice as high as I would expect or something like that. And does that kind of give you some sort of insight into whether you maybe have some sort of anomalous event? Yes, it, yes, it can. It, 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 it absolutely can. Uh, we were not really certain about that uh, uh, before. And the reason is that uh, the amount of mRNA in a cell also depends on the cell cycle. However, uh, it's, it's gene dependent. Uh, uh, so for example, cy looking at the cycling genes, one can tell where in the cell cycle a uh, cell is. And, and, from the, and then from the total amount of, of, of transcripts one measures, one could get a clue that this is probably not a single cell. But uh, this really, we, we don't think that that's a big problem. I, we are pretty uh, confident that we are getting uh, single cells in, in, in most of these reactions. And that that is fine. Uh, I should also I could also mention that there is a new tool out there. It's the uh, C1 from Fluidime that actually uh, allows you to collect individual cells, and you can control that you have a single cell per reaction. Ah, interesting. Is that uh, I, I'm assuming that probably captures them in a well. Is that how that works? Well, it actually uh, captures it in, in, a, in a very small reaction chamber rather than, than, than a well, but it's a, it's a microfluidic system. Sure. Very cool. I'll have to look into that. Um, okay. Uh, let's squeeze in one more question here. This person wants to know, how do you feel qPCR-based techniques compared to nanostring for single cell expression profiling? Are you familiar with that? Well, it's, uh, we don't have any uh, personal experience of, of single cell profiling with the nanostring technology. Uh, from what I read, it works fine, but one should be aware that uh, also the nanostring uh, workflow requires preamplification. And I think that as long as you have to include the preamplification, it does not really matter which technique you use. Uh, if you a, a major breakthrough would be if we could measure uh, the transcripts directly without preamp, that would be really great. But that's unfortunately not yet possible with the nanostring. Sure. Um, okay, uh, that's about all the time we have. There are still a couple more questions. Um, now we can look through them and see if there's some stuff that needs to be responded to after the fact. But uh, need to respect everybody's time here. So. With that, Professor Kabisa, I want to thank you again for this presentation. We very much appreciate it. It was very informative. And I want to thank everybody else for attending today. Um, this webinar has been recorded, and uh, it's one of a series of webinars that IDT will be presenting on single cell expression profiling and other topics. We will email you about these topics as they're scheduled. And as a reminder, you can find these videos recorded and they're on our website at www.idtdna.com. You'll find them under the support tab in our video library. And we'll have our webinars and some other videos on our YouTube channel, which is at www.youtube.com forward slash IDTDNA bio. And with that, again, thank you everybody for attending. We really appreciate it. And there were some great questions. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Thanks, Professor Kabista. Thank you.